Walter and Jesse stole a canister of meth from a chemical facility at the end of the past season, solving the meth precursor chemical shortage. Thus, high-quality blue meth appear. The two met with truck boss Tuko at the agreed upon how to complete the deal. For some minor offenses, Tuko unexpectedly beat one of his minions to death in front of Walter and Jesse warning them. Walter estimated their expenses in the car before leaving with Jesse. He budgeted $737,000. For their two children's college tuition, mortgage payments, and 10 years of expenses. To fulfill their target, they simply need to trade with Tuko for 11 weeks at $70,000 per week. Jesse remained dissociated after the horrible scene. Tuko, who had left a return, blocked Walter's passage. The henchman had fainted, not died. Tuko begged Walter to save him. Despite his chemical skills, Walter was poor at medicine. Walter grudgingly conducted cardiopulmonary resuscitation on the henchmen under Tuco's threat. Tuco ordered Jesse to start artificial respiration, but the henchmen died before he could. After the failed resuscitation, Tuco assaulted the body and ordered his men to bury it immediately. Tuco told Walter and Jesse to go immediately. Walter felt made easy as a murder witness. Walter struggled to control his conflicting emotions in front of the TV at home. Even Skylar behind him didn't notice. Walter tried to get close to his wife while Skylar cooked, possibly to reduce stress. Skylar didn't feel happy this time. She thought Walter was venting his emotions on her. Walter withdrew to the backyard to think after the failed attempt. Skylar later found him and sympathized with his treatment struggles. In any case, she said, using her as a punching bag was wrong. Jesse had been terrified since their last transaction with Tuco. He bought a weapon for self-defense to boost his courage. Jesse told Walter the next day that he had been receiving her asking calls and had seen a suspicious car, possibly Tuco's, near his home. Jesse felt Tuco was preparing to kill witnesses, therefore he thought they should shoot him during their next deal. As a newbie, Jesse didn't know how to wield a gun, thus his plan was to simple. He needed to plot carefully to kill Tuco. Marie and Skylar had been at odds since the theft and Skylar had avoided her for a while. Marie called Skylar and left a message inviting her to dinner to repair their relationship. Her past offense was not acknowledged to apologize for. Hank knew Marie's kleptomania had arranged for her to visit a therapist, but Marie refused to participate, making excuses and even purposefully running over unable boy's toy vehicle. Knowing Marie and Skylar hadn't mended and feeling trapped, Hank visited Walter's home in hopes that Skylar would forgive Marie. Skylar's emotions burst forth when Hank begged for her sister. Being pregnant and Walter's disappearances had exhausted her. Seeing Skylar like way, Hank was speechless and could only hug her. At the police station, Hank witnessed Walter and Jesse steal Matt the night on surveillance. Hank could tell they weren't novices by their technique, but their clumsiness showed they weren't seasoned criminals either. Drug traffickers may have compelled them to steal. Walter saw a suspicious black vehicle on his way home that night, recalling Jesse's warnings and becoming worried. The next morning, Skylar found Walter not in bed. Actually, he had spent the night by the window waiting for danger below, worried to call might hurt his family. Walter lied to Skylar, saying he couldn't sleep due to stomach problems. Skylar left without asking and went to bed. Walter quickly put the knife beneath the couch back where it was, preparing for a fight with Tuco. Walter decided to eliminate Tuco after a terrifying night. Naturally, Jesse supported, saying he had learned to wield a rifle and recommending Walter by one to boost their chances. Walter had a better idea. He created a bag of black beans with ricin within. In autopsies, forensic professionals have trouble finding a little dose that could kill. After obtaining the murder weapon, the toughest issue was poisoning Tuco without his knowing. They extracted the poison in Jesse's basement, then Walter had a great idea, waste the next batch of meth they traded with Tuco. Since Tuco personally inspected and tasted the product, their strategy would work. Hank, fresh from the crime scene, called Walter to report Skyler's emotional collapse. Hank hoped Walter could comfort Skylar more due to her pregnancy and due stress and sensitivity. Hank mentioned the crime, seeing corpses, and emailed Walter images as they talked. Walter was terrified by this news. 
He knew both corpses like Itako had initially beaten to death and the heavy enforcer who disposed of death. Walter knew Toe had been targeting witnesses without mercy since that day, including his subordinates. He worried that Tuko's hit list included him and Jesse, and they could die horribly if they weren't careful. Now it's either you or I die. Walter quickly told Jesse to leave, came home, and found the cash in the air vent. Finally, he put the money and pistol in a cardboard box likely to depart with his wife and son. After learning his son was missing, he grew nervous until Skylar told him he was playing at a friend's house. Skylar had no idea Walter was under so much psychological stress. Does reality really so bad? Not exactly. Walter overreacted because the huge guy died inadvertently from massive blood loss while disposing of the body not to go. Skylar was suspicious of Walter's odd conduct. He was unsure how to respond when questioned. Jesse called and Walter noticed his car parked downstairs out the window. Jesse was harshly chastised the previous time he showed here and invited. Since then, they agreed that Jesse couldn't visit Walter's house to avoid Skylar. Walter quickly ran downstairs after seeing Jesse's odd conduct. When they met, he asked Jesse about his presence to Mount. However, Jesse was too terrified to speak. Jesse was forced to come by Tuco, who intimidated Walter with a gun, to get inside the car. Walter didn't resist and got inside the automobile out of fear for his family. How does Tuco plan to use them? Could he be plotting against them? Hank hangs Tuco's portrait in the narcotics agency. Tuco's fingerprints were uncovered in an abandoned twerking lot last night, prompting an arrest. Tuko escaped after a number of underlings were captured. Hank expects Tuko will flee to Mexico based on experience. Hank rushes to Walter's house after boosting morale, knowing Walter's abduction. Hank examines Walter's car before entering, but finds nothing. Skylar and their son are giving statements to the police that they know Walter's height and appearance. Skylar remembers a phone call before Walter left, which is the strongest hint. We know Jesse called, but Walter's contact list didn't have this number. Hank realizes Walter needs on her phone after hearing this. Hank didn't inform Skylar because he feared she'd overthink. Skylar and her son could only print and post missing person notifications during the police inquiry. Marie occasionally joined Skylar to reassure her that the police will find the person. Murray wanted to explain about stealing gifts since their relationship was improving, but Skylar wasn't in the mood, so she didn't. Walter and Jesse were taken by Tuco to the US Mexico border in a smeltering trunk and nearly collapsed. It might have been too weary, and his body was feeble. Walter hallucinated Skylar when the trunk opened. Knowing the truth, she forgiven herself. This shows that Walter's biggest stress is making drugs behind his family, not cancer. Hank was Ritoko intended to go to Mexico. Walter was his target because he appreciated his drum-making skills. With Walter by his side, he may return to Mexico. After meeting Walter, Jesse was worthless. Walter protected him from Tuco's murderous intent. Tuco was too busy escaping to realize the big guy was dead. His nest was destroyed by narcotics enforcement authorities two days after he hadn't seen anyone. Tuco thought the big guy deceived him. Neither Walter nor Jesse want to go to Mexico with Tuco. Drugs are the only way to eliminate him. Everything will be fine if Tuco smokes the rest and waste meth package. Unexpectedly, Tuco smokes something else while Jesse intends to smoke this back. Marie, unsure what to respond, shouted that Walter has a second phone at Walter's residence. This unnerved Skylar. But knowing Walter, everyone thinks this is unlikely. Why ponder, didn't Walter mention he bought marijuana from Jesse? This may be related to him. Hank investigated Jesse's former house. After hearing it was a narcotics enforcement officer, Jesse's mother was reluctant to say anything. Hank got no concrete answers but unexpectedly validated Jesse's automobile model. If the car is in the positioning system, it can be tracked. Walter and Jesse are watching TV as Tuco cooks at the border. They have to quiz Uncle Tayo, a wheelchair-bound old man. Tayo, who cannot speak, can only make demands by ringing his wheelchair bell. Walter was furious when the scheme failed. Jesse spoke so much but couldn't get Tuco to inhale dangerous math, he grumbled. 
TV news material caught their interest then. Their fear of the large guy and small brother made them switch channels. Naruko thinks the big guy sold him out. He might lose control of his emotions if he realized the huge guy was dead, hurting him, Jesse. Walter and Jesse assumed Tayo had seen Nile dementia because Walter had tried him before, then the other party had no reaction, so they didn't take him seriously, and even discussed continuing the poisoning plot in front of him. Finally, when Tuchel was distracted, they added lethal amphetamine into the food. Walter and Jesse were startled when Tyre rang the bell as Tuco was about to eat it. Though he looked dumb, the old man had a keen mind. Tuco initially thought Tyre wanted to trade food. The bell kept ringing afterward. Tuco was furious as Tyo used all his muscle to throw the meal on the ground. He quickly discovered that Tyo was always glancing at Walter and them. Gradually, Tuco sensed trouble. He asked Tayo to ring the bell if he didn't like these two folks. Just then, the bell rang. Tayo rang the bell again when Tuco inquired if Walter and them were conspiring. Tuco finally realized Walter and Jesse were up to no good. Unfortunately, Tuco dragged Jesse outside and thrashed him. Walter ran away, but Tuco always had a rifle and couldn't help Jesse. Tuco made him ask what he wanted. Jesse was too terrified to speak. He worried Tuco would get out of hand and kill. Walter on the side had to admit he wanted to poison you like a lunatic. Tuco turned and gazed at Walter viciously after hearing this. Jesse grabbed a stone and whacked Tuco. They then battled. Luckily Jesse seized Tuco's rifle and shot him during the entanglement. To kicked him into a sand pit. Tuco limped but he howled in misery in the pit. The easiest way was to shoot again but Walter and Jesse lacked the guts. Since Jesse shot in self-defense, he can't kill now that he wants to. The two left Tuko alone in the hole. When they were about to leave, dust was flying on the little road and a car was rushing toward them. Walter suspected Tuko's cousin. Tuko had asked this gentleman to help several people cross the Ex-Mexico border into Mexico before. Tu rushed out of the car and hid to avoid detection. They were surprised when Tuco emerged from the sandbank and approached Jesse's automobile. The driving vehicle has already reached the modest dwelling. The automobile was Hank, not Cousin. Based on the automobile anti-theft location system, he saw the fugitive but not Jesse. Tuco immediately recognized Hank and the gunfire began. The two utilized the car body as cover to fight each other. Hank carried a pistol, but Tuco had a heavy machine gun. But narcotics enforcement cops had military experience and were not covered. The wise ones let Tuko run out of bullets quickly. Hank killed Tuko with one shot. Walter and Jesse, who were hiding in the dark and watching, were too afraid to breathe. Walter grabbed Jesse and fled when he spotted Hank coming. Hank is prominent and arrogant, yet his confrontation with Tuko demonstrates his strength. Hank is constantly there if Walter wants to grow in drug production. It's hard to fathom who would win if Hank realized Walter was creating narcotics. The external crisis has ended with Tuco's death. Walter vanished without explanation, and his second phone was found. Walter and Jesse fled the gunfight and walked to the road, where they raced in various directions. Walter got a ride. He seems to have considered how to justify his disappearance to his family. Walter went to his store before returning home. When he arrived naked, the supermarket personnel was alarmed and sent him to the hospital. Skylar and their son heard the news. Walter claimed to be dumb and amnesiac, saying he didn't remember his missing days. This reasoning would be absurd if applied to others, but Walter is a cancer patient who is critically ill, making his explanation plausible. Skylar and their son cried after seeing Walter was safe. How could they keep going? Hank recounts to Ko's death at the police station. He claims that he found Jesse using clues that day, but accidentally killed Tuco in self-defense. Jesse knows the cops will investigate him, so he cleans up drugs first when he gets home. Badger's cousin keeps the verve and drug-making supplies. Jesse then asks Badger to denounce him to the D anonymously, to get the D to arrest him without uncovering his drug-making. Exactly what is Jesse planning? Soon after, a group of heavily armed narcotics police broke into the motel, where Jesse and Wendy were arrested. Hank interrogated Jesse, 
who denied knowing Tuco. As for the car, he said it was stolen a short time ago Why it will be at the year. Yes. Mexico border he is not sure, but let Jesse Solid, the police found a sum of money in his car, and now he can only be Jesse was upset when cops found money in his car which he disputes. At the same time, Jesse insisted that the past three days had been in Wendy's stain in the hotel, never left although Jesse tried to clear everything, but Hank did not believe him and went to interrogate Wendy, Jesse and her beforehand for nothing. Hank is still nothing, this is Jesse's plan to get away with it. So far as he gives up easily, he decided to interrogate Tayo was furious off when Hank Christian. He decided to say was at the crime scene. Tayo is an aging thug who hates Jesse, but still does not cooperate with the cops. Jesse left the police station due to lack of evidence. He borrowed Wendy's phone to call his father for aid because he was broke. He requested to stay in the old house, but was denied. Since his brother framed him, Jesse's family is estranged. He had no choice but to remain in a street bakery. However, Walter ran nude in the supermarket and feigned to have amnesia, tricking Skylar and his son. The doctor was not easily misled. After hearing Walter's amnesia, the doctor sought to check his mental health, fearing a brain issue. Walter had to complete the assessment despite his objections. The psychiatrist found that Walter panicked at the news. Treatment can last days or months. Paimon delays can occur because patients cannot leave the hospital before the next assault. Walter inquired about doctor-patient confidentiality with the psychiatrist. The doctor told him they wouldn't share information without approval. Walter told the doctor he had no memory loss. He was an amnesic. Due to pressure, he pretended. He wanted to escape to relax and concerned about telling his family the truth. However, Walter's story made sense after the doctor understood his experience. Jesse contacted Walter in the evening and learned that he will be discharged from the hospital tomorrow. Walter's main concern is when he can continue making drugs with Jesse. Despite the many ups and downs, Walter remains resolute in his desire to make money by producing drugs. Jesse complains about many things. It is not easy to earn tens of thousands of dollars which were confiscated by Hank, making him poor. After hanging up the phone, Walter calculated the cash flow on hand and realized a serious problem. When preparing to escape with his wife and children, Walter had hidden money in the vent still in a cardboard box. He had been away for many days and was unsure if the items were still there. He was anxious at the thought of them being thrown away as garbage so he snuffed into his own home overnight. Luckily, the items were still in the box and Walter hid them in the air vents. He noticed Kyler and his son silhouette through the door and felt guilty. After returning to the hospital, Walter inserted the needle into his hand, pretending nothing had happened. The next day, Hank and Skyler mother and son came to pick up Walter, always high-profile Hank, not forgetting to talk about killing the call became a hero and even collected two ghosts to paste as a trophy. Walter couldn't bear to look at him directly, and his eyes have always been in the averted, finally be able to go home. At last, he can go home openly, so Walter is excited. To cultivate the couple's relationship with Skylar at night, he pretends to be a naked man. But Skylar's interest is not very high, so Walter's surprise is that Skylar asked about the second cell phone. In the face of the questioning, Walter does not know how to answer, and he wants to play the same trick again saying he can't remember anything. Skylar does not believe him, perhaps about the disappearance of the expoli explanation. He is also skeptical, just Skylar thinks Walter is because the pressure is too much, that secretly hiding the phone has been confirmed. Walter still wants to use the same old explanation, which obviously does not work. Skylar is very disappointed, turned off the light on the back of Walter slept. It seems a family crisis, a family crisis appears to be underway. The next night, Walter secretly met Jesse in a supermarket, knowing he is tight and giving him $600. Just then, a police officer entered the supermarket, forcing the two to stop talking. Walter told Jesse that the family has something. He wants to spend a few days to repair the family relationship and don't bother each other. To make up for the couple's feelings, Walter surprised Kyler and his son by taking the initiative to make breakfast the next morning. He also attempted to find common ground with his son, but with little success. While his son was at school, Walter talked about cell phones, 
Nafkaida was not convinced by his explanation and left the house in anger without her phone. While Walter's wife is away, he fixes the garage door to please Skylar. However, the response from the other side remains negative, indicating cold violence. In front of his son, Walter tries to be a good father. However, he knows that his son secretly changed his name to Flynn, which exhausts Walter's heart. Jesse has had a difficult few days too. During the last search, the police did not find any drugs in his house. However, Jesse's mother snuck into the basement after Hank found her. She saw all the evidence and took pictures. The house where Jesse's aunt lives does not belong to her, but to Jesse's parents. They are determined to take it back because they know their son is hopeless. Jesse has to move out in three days. He didn't take her mother's comments seriously and thought she was just angry. On the third day, Jesse was still asleep when her mother came to the door and realized the situation was dire. He pleaded with her mother to come to the basement. Jesse asked her mother for a second chance, a clean slate. However, her mother's attitude was determined and non-negotiable. The workers had already begun moving things out of the house. Jesse and her mother had a heated argument, but Jesse couldn't change her mother's mind before she left. His mother asked him to leave the front door and garage out. Jesse needs help and wants to call Walter, but Walter's home is a mess. Walter doesn't want to show anger in front of Skylar, so he pretends to receive a questionnaire and hangs up the phone. Jesse is in a hurry and calls Walter again, asking for money because he is homeless, but Juana refuses. Jesse's friend wanted to let him stay at home for a few days, but the friend's wife was concerned about the child's safety. As a result, Jesse had to leave in embarrassment. He tried calling a group of friends for help on the street, but unfortunately, none of them were able to assist him. In his desperation, Jesse recalls Badger's cousin's verve, which he thinks will work for the night. He sneaks into the trailer park at night and manages to pass through the massive metal entrance, but he falls into the makeshift restroom. After the blue liquid sprays on the floor, Jesse becomes a stinky mess and he can't tolerate the smell. He finally makes it into the recreational vehicle, puts on a gas mask, and lies down, practically crying as he recalls the day. The following morning, Badger's cousin noticed blue footprints on the floor and feared a robber was in the venue. However, he soon discovered Jesse in the car. The cousin informed Jesse that the VARV had been repaired, but the restroom would cost two dollars. He threatened Jesse to sell the car and its contents to pay off the debt. Since Jesse and Walter make money with the car, they cannot sell it. Jesse pleaded for two days to get the money. However, the other person did not trust him, so they booted him out of the trailer park and called the buyer. Jesse snuck inside and drove the recreational vehicle away when his cousin wasn't paying attention. It was too late by the time his cousin reacted. Walter felt suffocated by the tense atmosphere at home. While his son was at school, he hoped to talk to Skylar. He confessed that since his illness, he had caused a lot of harm to the family. He acknowledged that he had not been a good husband or father. However, he reassured Skylar that his love for her and their son would never change. Walter denies having a third party. He expects Beck Skylar to end the Cold War, which will only cause them to drift apart. However, Skylar knows that Walter owes a third party, which will only make them drift apart. Walter denied having a third party outside and hoped that Skylar would not continue the Cold War and grow apart. However, he owes her a reasonable explanation for the nagging. As long as he cannot explain why he secretly has a second cell phone, his wife's pressure will increase. Walter faces his wife's pressure and understands that their relationship has appeared irreparably strained, whether he discloses the truth or hides it. Skylar ended the conversation and drove away alone. At this moment, Walter saw a familiar vehicle. He walked over to see if it was the recreational drug making vehicle. He saw Jesse pull the car curtains to hide inside. Walter was disgusted to see him with a small blue man. Jesse knew appearing here was bad, but he claimed Hank stole all his money and Walter must be responsible. Walter insulted Jesse, calling him a fool and blaming him for causing trouble. Jesse, who was struggling with drug addiction, couldn't help but react and knocked Walter to the ground. 
The altercation occurred because Walter was frustrated with Jesse's lack of self-esteem and constant mistakes. The language used in this text has been simplified and made more accessible to a general audience. Jesse was angry with Walter and wanted to punch him, but he refrained. After calming down, Walter was kind enough to take Jesse home, give him half of the money he had saved, and ask him to make breakfast for him. Skyler went to the convenience store next to the gas station alone and bought cigarettes. When she returned to the car, the female driver noticed her smoking and ordered her to stop. Despite being pregnant, Skyler continued to smoke. When Walter went to the hospital for chemotherapy, Skyler was absent. As he watched the other patients and their families, Walter felt anguish but could not articulate his feelings. When the specialist asked, Walter acted strong and insisted that he and Skyler were right. The only consolation was that Walter's condition had improved after the first round of chemotherapy. The next round would start into months, when Skyler was due. Walter received a long and expensive hospital bill, causing him to appear bitter when paying. He refuses to accept a bailout from his old classmates and instead decides to produce narcotics. However, the costs of production and his half of the stash given to Jesse put him on the brink of ruin. To make ends meet, Walter reluctantly accepts money from Gretchen. Walter must make money quickly before Skyler's due date. Hank reports to these superiors. Since Tuka's death, the drug market has been quiet. But Hank has noticed Heisenberg. Hank earns a promotion, an increase, for his drug, busting skills. But with more power comes greater responsibility. And he's transferred on a joint border assignment. The mission lies in El Paso, Texas, on the Mexico. In El Paso, drug traffickers and users are common, making it dangerous. The promotion was thrilling. But no one realized Hank wasn't as tough as he seemed. Despite a pan, a episode in an elevator, he tried to appear normal. Hank's stress stemmed from his previous battle with Tuco when he was alone and had to fight the drug lord's miskits with a little revolver without knowing if Tuco's men would scare him. Additionally, Tuco was gravely injured, making the outcome likely. Although promoted, he must face more violent drug lords. Hank, like everyone else, was afraid. Hank took a day off on his second day of promoting to brew beer in his garage but he sliced his hand packaging the bottles. He heard gunshots in the middle of the night thinking his enemies were coming for revenge. Fearful, he walked outside to investigate but found simply his badly wrapped beer exploding. It was a false alarm, but Hank feared for his family. Hank dropped Tuko's braces into the river the next morning, a valued drelic that reminded him too much of its owner and caused him much psychological turmoil. Jesse drove to the trailer park in his leisure car after Walter gave him money. He had integrity and paid his debts while being a drug dealer. For mobility, he acquired a second-hand rent automobile from Badger's cousin and looked for a rental. A fair and handsome woman named Jane handled a rental property owned by her father, which Jesse easily found. Jane first needed Jesse to present income evidence, something a drug dealer wouldn't have, but Jesse secured the rental by playing the compassion car. The lucky coincidence was that Jane lived next door to Jesse suggesting a romantic relationship. After settling housing fees, Jesse contacted Walter again, and they cooked meth in the wild. With Tuco gone, they had no distributor, making it hard to sell their product in bulk. Walter had just two options partner with another large drug boss like Tuco or have Jesse sell the goods. Jesse surprised Walter by rejecting both ideas and suggesting they become their own Tuco. After years in the street, Jesse was confident in creating his own sales network. Making and selling their goods themselves would eliminate intermediaries and maximize earnings. More crucially, it would keep them away from the front lines, letting them generate large money safely. Walter initially opposed Jesse's proposal since he distrusted strangers. Jesse insisted on becoming a drug kingpin and refused to compromise. He even threatened to discontinue their partnership if Walter disagreed. Walter gave in and accepted Jesse's offer. Skinny Pete, Badger, and Combo soon arrived at Jesse's. Three of them were key to the sales network. Sales were based on selling one ounce of the substance for $2,500. The $500 apiece would be their part, and Jesse would get $2,000. Jesse's three entrepreneurial partners sold meth to addicts from diverse backgrounds at night. 
Jesse stored the finished product in concealed areas during the day for his companions to pick up. Everything was okay. They could make a lot without Jesse's help. However, something unexpected happened. Skinny Pete was surprisingly set up tonight while dealing with a female junkie. Skinny Pete ran with the woman to a hallway after hearing her cry that the cops were coming, only to find that her husband had been waiting there for a while. The couple took Skinny Pete's remaining meth. Jesse and Walter met outside. Walter never thought Jesse could succeed, but he was wrong. Jesse gave him a cash bag. Walter knew there was a problem. Computation showed an additional $1,000. Walter questioned Jesse, who told the truth. Jesse explained that Skinny Pete's merchandise had been stolen. Despite the loss, Jesse remained calm and sore and as an expected occurrence, similar to broken or expired items in a supermarket. However, Walter was not convinced and was more concerned about the possibility of future robberies and freeloaders. He feared that if a Dix heard about the robbery, it would attract and wanted attention, and Tuco would take swift action to teach the culprits a lesson. Walter believed that being too kind could hinder their efforts. Jesse believed that Walter was only concerned about money. The next day, Walter gave Jesse a revolver and hinted that they could not let the criminals get away with it. Jesse obtained the address of the drug-addicted couple from Skinny Pete. After considering Walter's words, Jesse confronted the pair. He mentally prepared himself before arriving at their doorstep day, but after waiting for 30 minutes with no answer, he was forced to enter through a window. Inside, he found a filthy house and a neglected boy, but the drug-addicted couple was nowhere to be found. The little boy stayed calm and ignored Jesse while watching TV on the sofa when he saw the stranger. The kind-hearted Jesse tried to change the station, but there was only one, and the TV was showing unacceptable stuff for kids. Jesse tried to get information about the drug-addicted couple from the little child, but he failed. After the boy stated he was hungry, Jesse became his impromptu babysitter, prepared dinner, and played hide-and-seek. A disturbance outside signaled the drug-addicted couple's return. Jesse rushed the toddler into a room after seeing this. As soon as the couple entered, they argued nonstop. Jesse surprised them and defeated the drug addict. Jesse's gun frightened them, so they surrendered. Jesse urged them to give up what was left, but they had barely any meth. The woman lost some meth, which caused their dispute. The man told Jesse they had money even after they ran out of meth. He then took Jesse to the yard and showed him how they had taken from a nearby location. However, the truth was that the couple had stolen it from a convenience store, and someone had witnessed the entire process and was brutally murdered. The police were investigating the crime scene. Jesse and the drug addict took turns trying to break open the app machine with a sledgehammer, but they were unsuccessful. While they were working, the boy in the room woke up and asked Jesse to play hide and seek. The drug addicted woman took advantage of this distraction and knocked Jesse out with the liquor bottle. Later, they retrieved the meth they had given her. Jesse woke up after an unknown time. The couple tried to open the app. The man was managing the machine from underneath, while the lady, unsatisfied after eating meth, sought to eat her husband's, causing an argument. In her drug-induced stress, the addict suddenly pushed over the app machine, crushing her husband to death. She gently removed the meth from his body and lie on the sofa to continue feasting. Jesse was appalled by this horrific scene and hastily wiped his fingerprints from the machine. Ironically, the ad machine unlocked itself and a lot of bills flew out. Jesse quickly collected the money and informed the kid to play hide and seek. He covered the boy's eyes and brought him outside, telling him to sit still and not enter the house. Jesse wanted to spare the boy the anguish of seeing his father's death. Jesse called the police before leaving, expecting them will come soon. Walter's life took some changes during this time. Gretchen called Skylar early in the morning to worry about Walter's health. Skylar expressed her thanks during the call because she always thought Gretchen and her husband were paying Walter's medical bills. Gretchen quickly recognized Walter had lied to his wife, but she didn't tell the truth. They decided to discuss matters at Walter's place that afternoon. Walter had returned to school and knowing that his lies could be discovered at any time. Walter had an uncomfortable incident while taking his son home after school. 
To mimic Walter's naked supermarket episode, someone posted a missing person flyer on his car window. Walter became upset and asked his son who did it. He joked that his son should tell him the perpetrator's name so he could tie them up and put them in the desert. Despite knowing his father was joking, his son was thrilled, and their father-son connection improved. Walter saw Gretchen's automobile in the yard before stepping out of the car, and he felt gloomy. Fortunately, Gretchen simply confirmed Walter's lies, but didn't tell Skylar. Gretchen left due to traffic when Walter returned. Walter and Gretchen met at a restaurant later. Walter apologized for lying, but Gretchen couldn't understand why he lied instead of accepting their support. Walter wouldn't say more, especially about his drug manufacturing and sales. Gretchen was upset by Walter's secrecy. Surprised, Walter became increasingly enraged and accused her of betraying him with Elliot after they broke up, using his findings to launch their company. Walter believes Gretchen and Elliot wouldn't be successful without him. Gretchen claimed Walter left them first. Walter's allegations and insults grew, driving Gretchen away. Walter may have acted out of fear of attention rather than animosity. Walter went home after his bad experience with Gretchen. Skyler told him Gretchen contact him to end up financial support. Skyler was devastated, but Walter was relieved. To justify the termination of their support, Walter said that Gretchen and her husband's company was near insolvency. Skyler suddenly remembered that Gretchen had arrived in a fancy sports vehicle which didn't indicate financial problems. Walter dismissed it, claiming wealthy people always worried about appearances. Skyler reluctantly accepted this explanation, feeling overwhelmed. Walter reminded her that problems always have solutions. He added that Gretchen and her husband had already paid a lot for him, so they had done their bit. Walter had improved his lie, telling skills so much that he no longer needed to draft them. Walter concealed his second cell phone in the classroom ceiling to keep his wife from finding it. Jesse hadn't replied in a while, surprising him. After seeing the drug dealer slain by an M machine, Jesse acquired a psychological trauma. He hadn't left home recently. Walter went to Jesse's house after being unable to reach him. After many unsuccessful mocks, Jane, the neighbor, came out. After learning Jane was the landlord, Walter pretended to be Jesse's father to get in. Jesse, who had been hidden in the room and heard the ruckus, opened the door while Jane hesitated. Walter was furious with his messy appearance. He was more horrified when he heard someone had died. Thankfully, Jesse didn't kill the individual. Jesse shared his money with Walter. Jesse refused to meet with Badger and the others until he recovered from business. Walter had to pretend to be Heisenberg and meet them. Three were very obedient when they saw Walter. Did Heisenberg already have such a big impact? Jesse was rumored to have told a drug dealer with an ab machine, which prompted many addicts to pay off their debts quickly. Walter saw a better business opportunity and proposed expanding the enterprise by having Badger, Skinny Pete, and Combo recruit new dealers and sell drugs in other territories. Walter told Jesse, maybe you used to be a pushover, but now things are different. Jesse hesitated to invade other space. After news of the drug dealer's death spread throughout the city, no one dared to mess with Jesse. Although he had not killed anyone, Jesse felt terrible. He had authority as long as others believed he was responsible, regardless of the truth. Eventually, Walter's brainwashing succeeded. Skylar returned to her previous job to help with household expenses. Ted, Skylar's former supervisor, reinstated her as an accountant despite the challenges pregnant women face in finding employment. It was discovered that Ted was a wealthy bachelor and father of twin girls, having divorced two years prior. Fortunately, Skylar's task was resolved. This astonished Marie because Ted had previously expressed inappropriate affections for Skylar. Skylar swiftly responded that she was solely interested in making money now and had no further plans. Skylar said this, but Ted's genuine motives were unclear. The next morning, Walter spotted Skylar dress formally and understood she had rejoined her old company. He didn't like his wife working so hard, but he couldn't stop her. Skylar believed that not producing money was no longer an option. Hank moved into his office and felt alone without his usual co-workers to joke around with. 
He struggled to fit in with his new colleagues who had experienced dealing with us Mexico drug lords and may have viewed his success against Go as luck. Additionally, Hank was unable to join in on his co-workers' conversations due to a language barrier. Hank and his colleagues met with their informant Tortilla to gather leads. Hank was surprised by the varying attitudes his co-workers had towards informants. Those from challenging bordered areas were not to be underestimated, and as such, narcotics agents held them in high regard. Hank became frustrated when he probed Tortilla for more information and received ambiguous answers. He asked the informant for the drug dealer's transaction details, but he ignored him. Eventually, he revealed the dealer's identity. Drug enforcement officials set up an ambush at the stated spot, but after half a day, no drug dealers were found. Hank then noticed a strange image through his binoculars. He observed their informant Tortuga's head gently moving on the ground. Everyone went to the location to find the drug traffickers had slain the informant and tied his head to a turtle. If the informant's name was revealed, other drug traffickers would retaliate frantically. Border drug enforcement personnel were used to such oddities, but Hank was nauseated as he stood alone. Hank's co-workers mocked his reaction. However, something unexpected happened. Tortuga's ground-level brain exploded as everyone mocked Hank. Drug enforcement agents were instantaneously blasted several meters away and drained them. Only Hank, in the beside, survived. Jesse overcame his psychological barriers and instructed Badger and the others to expand their operations, thus initiating team growth. However, Walter believed that this was insufficient. He aimed to monopolize the medication market and increase their prices, which he deemed low. Jesse, who liked knowledge of economics, did not object. One day, while Jesse was out of his room, Jane painted in front of his door. Jesse and Jane bonded over their shared interest in tattoo artistry. While they were chatting, a motorcyclist approached and praised Jesse for his knowledge of drugs. Jane also noticed that Jesse was different from others she had met. Jesse eventually revealed his true identity down that he and Walter were not related. He also promised not to engage in any illegal activities at home. To ease the tension, Jesse invited Jane over to watch TV. Jesse was unable to operate the new TV. There was no signal and they felt embarrassed. The blue screen made them feel stupid. Jesse tried to encourage Jane to relax, but the TV still refused to work. During this struggle, something unexpected happened. Jane took Jesse's hand, expressing their affection. They were both emotional after witnessing the blue screen on the TV and ended up engaging in intimate behavior. Jesse suggested smoking marijuana, but Jane declined, revealing that she had been sober for 18 months. Jesse denied having an addiction, claiming he only indulged occasionally. Walter wanted Skylar to rest at home on Saturday. However, she insisted on working extra at the company because it paid double. Walter felt uneasy about her low-cut dress. After Skylar departed, Murray called Walter to inform him that Hank had returned and was mentally ill. Walter visited Hank and learned what had happened to him at the border. Due to panic attacks, Hank secluded himself in his room and wouldn't see Marie. As Walter entered, Hank sat up in bed, afraid to show his vulnerability. Knowing Hank well, Walter encouraged him to overcome his fear. Since entering the drug industry, Walter had faced death consistently. He told Hank that he had always been cautious but remained calm after receiving his fatal prognosis. Fear is often the biggest obstacle. Walter hoped that Hank would face reality. Hank used to see Walter as a timid high school instructor, but today's statements changed his mind. With Walter's help, Hank calmed down and returned to work. He joked and pretended to be strong around his co-workers as usual. Jesse and Walter expanded their business and made a lot of money. They even need a cash counter. However, their excitement was dampened when Badger was arrested during a transaction. Badger was caught red-handed by a tall, slender man on a public bench, whom he suspected was an undercover cop. The police questioned Badger at the station to identify the drug boss. It's fortunate that Badger didn't betray Jesse and Walter. At that moment, Saul, a lawyer, arrived and dismissed the police, stating that he needed to speak with his client privately. 
Saul came alone to drum up business. Badger never hired him. Who exactly is he? Saul is a skilled lawyer with a strong ethics, despite being smooth and maybe untrustworthy. He uses innovative approaches to help his clients win lawsuits. When Walter expressed doubts about Saul's promise of perfect exoneration for Badger, they went to Saul's office to inquire about the matter. Saul appeared confident about the trial. Walter discovered that the police were pursuing the notorious drug board Heisenbach, and they only needed Badger's testimony to ensure a smooth operation. This news shocked Walter. He immediately offered Saul ten dollars dearer to save Badger without implicating Heisenberg. Despite his love of money, Saul refused Walter's bribe. That night, Walter and Jesse donned masks and abducted Saul from his office, taking him far away. Jesse said plainly that Saul should have taken the ten dollars zero during the day. Saul refused because he never takes bribes from strangers, even if it would have avoided difficulties. Jesse threatened Saul demanding that he help Badger escape punishment without revealing anything about Heisenberg. If Saul refused, they would bury him away right then and there. At that moment, Walter, who had been silent the whole time, couldn't suppress a cough, and Saul instantly recognized him. With the truth out in the open, Walter decided to remove his mask and breathe the fresh air. Saul ultimately agreed to the duo's demands, though he couldn't guarantee that Badger wouldn't eventually talk. He was puzzled why they didn't just eliminate Badger if they were so concerned about him leaking information. While others might resort to such measures, Jesse wasn't that kind of person. To him, Badger wasn't just a subordinate but a brother. The next day at the Anti-Drug Bureau, the police continued to interrogate Badger, with Saul also present. Eventually, Badger disclosed the physical description of Heisenberg, an average, built bald, elderly man. The police hoped Badger could arrange a meeting with Heisenbach while they lay in wait nearby, ready to spring into action for the arrest. Of course, the person meeting Badger wouldn't be the real Walter, but rather a criminal named Jimmy. This individual had already spent for two for years behind bars, making incarceration almost a profession for him. As long as someone was willing to pay, he was ready to take the blame and endure prison life. Surprisingly, Compared to the complex and dangerous world outside, life in prison seemed to bring him happiness. And two men almost wasted their hard-earned money again. The next day, Badger returned to the bench on a police monitoring to meet the fake Heisenberg. However, Passerby almost ruined the plan. Walter, who was watching closely, quickly drove to Hank and pretended it was a chance meeting, mocking his view. Jesse reminded Badger that it wasn't Jimmy. Badger met the real Jimmy, and everything went well. The police arrived, and Jimmy kneeled in submission. The anti-drug cops rejoiced over Heisenberg's capture. Hank was suspicious since the arrest went smoothly, which was unusual. While grading student homework, Walter was unexpectedly approached by Saul. Saul was an amazing person, who was able to easily track Walter's movements using a private tie. He even knows Heisenberg's real name. Despite his business motives, Saul wants to form a solid alliance with Walter. Walter may need a lawyer because he will likely face narcotics enforcement officials. Professional assistance can simplify things. Money must be laundered appropriately. Walter used to hide the money at home, but that is not sustainable. Saul advised, if you want to earn more money and keep it successfully, remember to find me before leaving. The Badger incident made Saul's abilities clear. Jesse is reckless and Walter is smart but impulsive. With Saul's help, they may be able to handle non-drug situations more effectively. The family took Walter to the hospital for a checkup. The results took a week. Following the exam, Walter saw a mirror image of the skin and noticed a large white shadow in his lungs. In Saul's office, Walter discussed money laundering. Walter was worried about his health and wanted to work extra to wanted to earn money. Jesse and Jane were happy together in their own world. Walter called Jesse to ask for four days off so they could work on their business out of town. Jesse hesitated because he had plans to go to a museum with Jane. Walter lied and said they needed to return to work soon because the pseudo fair, Nene had worked hard for what expired. Jesse accepted after some hesitation. Walter wanted to make drugs and privacy, so he leaned to Skylar about meeting his mother, fearing he could die without the chance. 
Skylar quickly calmed Walter by claiming the test results might be fine. Later, she drove him to the station. Walter stayed at the station until Jesse drove by slowly. They went to the outskirts. Jesse wanted to call Jane to ease his loves and six upon arrival but his phone had no signal. Walter's phone had one bar, but he refused to lend it. Jesse carelessly threw the car keys on the table and asked Walter to move them elsewhere, which made Walter grumble. Jesse confidently turned the keys in the ignition and immediately got to work producing drugs. They worked tirelessly in rotating shifts to improve efficiency, resulting in four pounds of finished goods in just two days. Selling everything would net each of them $672,000. Walter and Jesse were thrilled upon hearing the number, but their joy was short-lived. As they were leaving, the car lost power. Jesse had depleted the battery by leaving the keys and the ignition for two days. Despite his sorrow, Walter searched for solutions. Fortunately, the car had a generator so they only needed to charge it. Walter quickly extracted fuel from the car and instructed Jesse to pour it into the generator. Due to Jesse's clumsiness, fuel spilled everywhere, causing the generator to burst unexpectedly. Walter retrieved the fire extinguisher from the car. Suddenly, Jesse acted swiftly and extinguished the fire with water. He extinguished the fire with good intentions, but the generator was irreparably damaged. Jesse climbed onto the car roof to get a phone connection, then called for rescue while stranded in the desert. Unfortunately, luck was against them, so he had to ask Walter for his phone again. Walter initially refused to provide his phone, worried that Skylar would discover suspicious bill activity. With no other options available, they couldn't risk being stranded permanently. Jesse reluctantly borrowed Walter's phone, called Skinny Pete for help, and gave in their location to leave immediately. Skinny Pete did not arrive, so they waited in the wild until dusk due to the distance. They endured the cold due to the temper cart to between day and night. When Jesse called Skinny Pete again, he found out that he had gone the wrong way. Jesse wanted to remind Skinny Pete again, but his phone battery died. Therefore, the two of them faced the harsh conditions of nature for a night in the desert. The next morning, Walter mustered the strength to crank the generator. Replenishing the battery in this rudimentary manner was physically demanding and time-consuming. Walter and Jesse alternated, but Walter, exhausted from the previous night, fell asleep in his chair. Despite numerous attempts to contact Walter, Jesse received no response and began to fear the worst. After an undetermined amount of time, Jesse attempted to start the car, but it failed, leaving him disappointed and regretful for bringing Walter. Jesse approached Walter, who was coughing blood. Jesse understood something was alright when he discovered Walter's haste was due to his declining health, not the meth expiring. They sat in the car, and Walter contemplated his life since cancer diagnosis. He admitted to telling his family and Jesse more lies to make money from drug manufacture. He felt discouraged. Each realization shook him. Jesse wanted to leave to avoid death, but Walter warned that they were hungry, thirsty, and dehydrated. He cautioned that going outside would result in death within an hour. Jesse grew furious and asked why Walter couldn't use the car's resources to make a rocket robot, despite its seeming absurdity. But Jesse's suggestion inspired Walter to make a new battery. Jesse was instructed to empty his pockets and retrieve any pure plated cores as well as a brake pad from the automobile. He agreed and Walter constructed six batteries. This was their final opportunity to leave the wild. Nervously, Walter inserted the automobile key into the ignition and it worked. They drove to the station where Jesse, sensing Walter's anxiety, promised to give that drug sales money to Walter's family if he were to die. Walter was comforted by Jesse's reassurance. After a week, Walter's family returned to the hospital. The doctor had expected his tumor tissue to shrink by 25 after treatment, but it shrank by 80. Walter's condition seems to have improved rather than worsened. The white shadows on the prior scans were pneumonia, and Walter's bloody cough was caused by esophageal ribbing. After hearing the wonderful news, Walter's family cried. However, they realized that they had to continue treatment and couldn't relax. However, the panic turned out to be a false alarm, which was a great relief. Afterward, Walter went to the bathroom and smashed the iron tissue box until his hands split. 
This was a release from a week-long fear of death. Walter and Jesse agreed to meet at a restaurant after parting ways at the station. Jesse was thrilled to hear Walter's good news. After giving him the money, Jesse asked Walter what to do. Walter wanted to slow down, and he would leave when they sold out the inventory. Jesse followed Walter's wishes despite being astonished. Skyler hosted a weekend party to commemorate Walter's improved health. As usual, Walter remained invisible as Skyler recounted the family's life supporting him through cancer. Walter didn't appreciate that Gretchen and Elliot were thanked for their sponsorship, despite him risking his life for the money. When he spoke up, everyone was confused. He asked Fade why he got sick and recovered, leaving others unsure how to respond. In reality, Walter's remarks reflected personal guilt. He once made drugs out of desperation, but now that his disease was under control, he regretted it. Afterwards, Walter and his son joined Hank by the poolside for drinks. Hank, who could never shake off his habit of showing off, kept regaling his son with the stories of his drug bust experiences. His boastful behavior inadvertently exposed Walter's dark side. Walter was no longer the same Walter. He was both a mundane high school teacher and the formidable drug lord Heisenbrunt. In front of Hank, Walter unexpectedly poured drinks for his son. Initially, Hank didn't pay much attention, considering it was a good day and a little alcohol wouldn't hurt. But Walter seemed relentless in his actions, and Hank couldn't bear it any longer. He finally took away the bottle. To his surprise, Walter showed no sign of backing down, asserting his dominance by declaring that this was his house and both the alcohol and his son belonged to him. Stunned by Walter's words, Hank could only conceal his embarrassment with a forced smile. Just then, their son began violently vomiting by the poolside. Skylar rushed over upon hearing the commotion, bringing an end to the chaos. The morning after the party, Walter realized he had crossed a line. He promptly contacted Skylar, but she was unhappy and did not respond. To make amends, Walter did something for the family. He bought a new water heater to replace the neglected one. The shopkeeper suggested a cheaper option, but Walter, being wealthy and indulgent, said money was no problem. Walter's final purchase was the latest and most advanced water heater. While paying, he carefully counted a stack of dollars and found one with blood marks. Walter quickly hid it in his pocket while the shopkeeper was distracted. Jesse and Jane spent time together absorbed in their affection. Jesse shared his childhood sketchbook with her, appreciating simple pleasures. Jane's father unexpectedly visited, cutting short their euphoria. Jesse eagerly awaited an introduction, but was disappointed when Jane referred to him as a tenant. Jesse's heart sank. Later, Jane revealed that her father was strict and wouldn't approve of their relationship and, unless Jesse was working. Jesse was infuriated by the news. He felt belittled by Jane, but she apologized and acknowledged his merit. She may have realized that she had hurt his pride. Jesse was actually easy to please. Walter installed the water heater himself. This delighted his kin. He deeply apologized to his son for pouring drinks at the gathering. His kind-hearted son didn't blame him, believing it was his own responsibility for poking into the pool. After hearing his son's statements, Walter felt guiltier and replaced the rotten floorboards. He bought new flooring and immersed himself in the process. Walter did not notice the minor changes that Skylar made with her supervisor, Ted. While working late, Skylar discovered inconsistencies in the company's accounts. After learning the truth, Ted attempted to persuade her that the accounts were not a significant issue. During their conversation, Skylar cried, possibly recalling Walter's behavior in a party. Ted immediately comforted Skylar by holding her hand, showing his affection. Although her gestures seemed awkward, Skylar wiped her tears with a tissue and then held Ted's hand again. During these days, Walter fixed the flooring and skipped breakfast. He began to address his error, but also felt uneasy with the sudden free time. Skylar did not appreciate Walter's hard work and found it strange. At night, Walter purchased paint from the store and noticed a grocery cart on his way. He wondered if it was one of his drug-making supplies. The worker who chose the wrong material was clearly inexperienced in medication synthesis. Walter, expert, couldn't resist giving advice. 
When the individual saw Walter as a threat, they ran away without taking the shopping cart. Walter felt Mizzy and followed them until the event seemed to end. He saw the newbie meet a bald man with a car similar to Jesse's. He ordered them to leave his domain with authority. His intimidating or made them charge away quickly. This incident showed that Walter's behavior betrayed him despite his promises of quitting the drug industry. Although Walter manufactured drugs for profit, it had become a part of his life. On a typical day, Combo was selling drugs on the street when a car pulled up next to him. Two men inside the car appeared unfriendly, and Combo assumed they were buyers. However, they stared at him for a moment before leaving. They didn't go far and watched him cautiously from a corner. Sensing trouble, Combo immediately called Skinny Pete for help. He was unable to get through and left a message with his location, indicating that he was being watched. Combo failed to notice a boy riding a bike nearby who then shot him after he hung up the phone. Combo attempted to leave, but the boy fired more shots, causing him to collapse in a pool of blood. Walter and Skyler are in a medical follow-up. The doctor informs them that Walter's condition is stable, but removing the malignant tissue is necessary to prevent its spread. Skyler is surprised to learn that the operation cost $200 zero. Walter, unconcerned about the cost, decides to proceed with the surgery. He believes that drug trading will bring him the necessary funds quickly. Walter's confidence confuses Skylar. She doesn't know his plan. The doctor agrees to postpone Walter's procedure for four weeks so he can attend Skylar's birth. Walter calls Jesse from his second phone at school to check on drug sales. He discovers that unknown intruders shot and killed Colbo. Walter is indifferent to these associates and doesn't even know who Combo is. Jesse is angry and hangs up. The turf war kills Combo as expected. Jesse has no idea who the killer is since no one saw him. Before dying, Combo warns Skinny Pete of a threat. It's evident that Walter's recent expansion into other drug dealers' territory linked to Combo's death. Jesse's reputation is ruined because the public now knows he lead about telling a cocaine dealer with an app. Their sales network collapses just when it was starting to operate. Jesse and Walter's booming business collapses abruptly. They asks all for help when they have no other options. After hearing the whole story, Sal ridicules them, calling them amateur drug dealers who have only made it this far by luck. Walter and Jesse are upset while Sal remains calm. He is surprised that the two still have 30 pounds of product and wonders why they are afraid of a gold mine. Saul already has a plan and suggests that he knows someone who can introduce them to a 20-year veteran, narcotics distributor. He only exports wholesale and has never made a mistake. He sees selling drugs as selling high-profit everyday items. He acts like a businessman, unlike two cars. As Loki as Walter, this mastermind's real name is unknown to even resourceful Saul. Jesse feels depressed at home after Combo's death. He takes some hits to calm down. He tells Jane to depart first to avoid influencing him while sober. Jane returns after leaving, unable to resist narcotics. Walter arrives at a fried chicken restaurant the next morning to meet the drug lord. Jesse arrives late, wives late, weary and drunk. Walter only cares about selling narcotics. He doesn't mention Combo, which annoys Jesse. Jesse leaves in frustration. Walter goes to the hospital after waiting for the mysterious drug, Ward who never arrives. Skylar has her prenatal checkup today. Even though Walter is late, Skylar doesn't scold him and seems happy. After the checkup, Skylar goes to the company to celebrate Ted's birthday. Their ambiguous acts and statements at the party could deceive others into thinking they are in a relationship. Saul calls Walter to inform him that the major drug lord has arrived at the fried chicken shop but won't work with him. Walter is not easily defeated. He waits until nightfall at the restaurant but the other party does not arrive. After some time, Gus, the proprietor of the fried chicken store, introduces himself to Walter. Gus refused to work with Walter because of Jesse's drug use and hardiness that day. Gus criticized Walter's judgment in choosing Jesse. Walter defended his decision, stating that he trusts Jesse despite his imperfections. He confidently tried to change Gus's mind, arguing that his high-grade meth will be in high demand. 
He also claimed that even if he raises his rates, customers will still come. After hearing Walter's points, Gus says they will talk later. Before leaving, he warns Walter not to trust drug addicts. Skylar finds Ted's $1 million tax scam. Skylar doesn't want to expose Ted or become involved. Her initial reaction is to resign and move on. Later, she returns, showing worry for Ted. Jane visits Jesse, who has been hiding at home since his fight with Walter. She delivers drugs for them to use. She still lives a chaotic existence, and her drug addiction looks worse than Jesse's. Gus finally contacts Walter, who eagerly heads to the fried chicken establishment. He doesn't find Gus. The crew tell him Gus has 14 fried chicken businesses and appears at any location. A stranger tells Walter the deal's location as he's panicking. Gus is willing to pay one million for all of Walter's merchandise, but the agreement must be made within an hour or wood would be lost. Without delay, Walter understands Jesse has all the inventory. Jesse is hard to reach by phone, reinforcing Gus's opinion that drug addicts are unreliable. Walter breaks into Jesse's house and finds him and Jane asleep from drug use. Walter splashes water and slaps Jesse to sober him up till he extracts the inventory's location. Skylar texts to Walter that their daughter is due. Walter must choose between his wife and daughter and a big payday. Walter prioritizes the deal over Skylar's circumstances after an internal struggle. Walter rationalizes that only by getting the money can he improve his family's life despite its difficulty. Walter rushes to the meth deal site and completes the transaction before going to the hospital. He arrives to late. Skylar delivered their daughter successfully, and Ted took her to the hospital. Despite Walter's absence, Skylar isn't angry. This suggests that her affections for Walter have reduced, showing an increasing distance. Walter disguises his return home as getting a change of clothes to hide the one million. The next morning, Jesse and Jane are still asleep. Jane's father phones her to remind her about the Narcotics Anonymous meeting. Jane appears rest throughout the conference and her father assumes she is falling in love with Jesse, but she denies it. Jesse wakes up to find a gaping hole in the door. He has no memory of Walter caring for him. Upon discovering missing kitchen inventory, Jesse panics and assumes there has been a break-in. He quickly calls Walter to report the incident. Walter blames Jesse for forcing him to miss his daughter's birth as punishment. Walter does not tell Jesse the truth and abruptly ends the call, leaving him to face his dread and fear. The Walters celebrated their daughter's birth with a family celebration in the evening. Hank quartered fried chicken for the occasion. Walter recognized the packaging bags from Gus Fried Chicken Restaurant. Hank had no idea two major drug lords were so near. Skyler wanted to return to work quickly to cover their daughter's and Walter's surgical costs. Walter couldn't tell his family he was about to become a millionaire. He could only show his daughter his earnings after his family went to bed. Jesse arrived at school the next day grumpy. After seeing Walter's note before the deal, he discovered the truth. He accused Walter of playing him, infuriating Walter. Drug dealers must always be ready. Walter briefly held off on giving Jesse the money due to his recent stable conduct. He worried that money might make Jesse irresponsible and kill himself. After seeing this, Jesse vowed to behave and quit drugs. Walter remembered Gus's counsel, so Jesse's words no longer worked. Without Jesse buying a drug testing kit at the drugstore to establish he hadn't used narcotics, Walter wouldn't believe him. Jesse departed in fury because Walter was serious and wouldn't give him the money immediately. Skylar informed him that their son had quietly started a crowdfunding page to aid the family financially when he returned home. Walter felt uneasy about his homepage photo. He knew his son's acts were good, but his damned pride kept getting in the way. How could Walter accept such a blatant charity request? He couldn't spend his mind journeys. Walter, discouraged, asked all for guidance and was inspired. Saul told him crowdfunding was good and proposed employing hackers to divide the monies into smaller sums and transfer them to multiple accounts before redistributing them to Walter's donation account. Thus, money wandering would succeed. The news relieved Walter. Jesse returned home and used drugs with Jane after Walter rejected him. 
Jane was surprised to find Walter owed Jesse for $180 by Javon advice Jesse to collect. The next day, Jane missed her rehab appointment. Her father saw her and Jesse doing drugs when he checked on her. He also spotted drug paraphernalia on her bedside table. Her father dragged Jesse to the ground in anger. Jesse, terrified, grabbed the baseball bat to defend himself. Her father was horrified when his daughter relapsed into addiction and turned Jesse into the police, but Jane begged him to spare him and swore to get clean. Her father agreed reluctantly. Gus was right again joned and didn't want to stay clean, especially because Jesse still had $480, cider and drug money. Jane called Walter and the reporter if he didn't give her the money to escape her father's tyranny. Jesse didn't want this, but love blurred his judgment. Walter brought $480 zero to Jesse's house in the evening. Jesse looked away from Walter, feeling terrible. Walter wanted to advise Jesse, but Jane calmly closed the door. Walter drank in a bar to forget his problems and found Jane's father there also. They talked, both worried by Jane and Jesse. Walter chastised his unruly nephew, clearly Jesse, while Jane's father advised Walter to never leave family. Walter changed his mind after hearing this. He couldn't bear to see Jesse continue. He returned to Jesse's residence to discover them both drunk. Walter tried to stir Jesse up but knocked Jane off her side and made her lay flat, which was perilous for a drugged person. Soon, Jane began to vomit, and it wouldn't be long before she choked. Walter instinctively wanted to save her, but hesitated the next moment. He knew that as long as Jane was around, Jesse wouldn't listen to him and would eventually dig his own grave. Moreover, Jane knew too much, posing a threat to Walter himself. In the end, Walter watched helplessly as Jane choked to death on her own vomit. Making such a decision was agonizing for Walter, but he felt he had no other choice. Jesse wakes up to see Jane dead. He desperately tried to revive his sweetheart but failed. Jesse was distraught over Jane's untimely death. He called Walter for advice, unsure what to do. Walter, who had a plan, encouraged Jesse not to worry and promised to handle it. Mike was sent to Jesse's house by Saul shortly after. Mike appeared skilled. He promptly removed the situation and urged Jesse to call the police and give clear explanations. Jesse's anguish from losing his girlfriend persisted. As precaution, Mike slapped Jesse's face hard, forcing him to repeat what he was told for he was told. After gathering himself, Jesse emotionally recounted the lines to the police, providing all the information. After taking the drug money and narcotics back, Mike fled. Following the arrangement with Jane, the father planned to take her to rehab. After arriving at the door, he spotted an ambulance and felt ominous. He was saddened when he found Jane dead. He wasn't angry after seeing Jesse. Jesse followed Mike's instructions and told the authorities he woke up to find Jane dead and remembered nothing else. Given the circumstances, officials may determine her death was a drug overdose. While Walter's youngster was excited, tiny donations from sympathetic people gave the family hope. These monies appeared because Saul hired hackers, but only Walter knew. Walter was glad that his drug money was finally being used. As the crowdfunding website Samount climbed, Skylar and her kid were too excited to eat. Walter concerned about Jesse's fate. Walter already considered Jesse his son. Walter and Mike arrived at a rundown workplace full with junkies where Jesse had fallen into despair. Jesse used drugs to cope with losing his lover. After much searching, Walter discovered Jesse. He fondly called him some this time. Jesse couldn't resist Walter's fatherly tone. He sobbed in Walter's embrace, unleashing all his feelings, including grief for Jane's death. Walter felt deep compassion for Jesse's despair. Jesse was taken to a rehab center by Walter to recuperate from addiction. Walter told Jesse he couldn't visit him until after surgery with unknown results. If he dies, Jesse should look for Saul to take the money. Hank raised money for Walter at the D, and colleagues gave generously. Hank later brought out a combo picture. Normally, Hank wouldn't have noticed minor character combo. However, his blue meth was intriguing. This verified Hank's concerns that the Heisenberg he had readily arrested was false. He also found that addicts in many states sought out this blue meth. 
discuss quick distribution of blue meth across states showed he had a plan. Three important bosses, including Gus, were visiting the D headquarters for an investment probe. Using his businessman identity, Gus could readily get precinct information. Gus saw Walter's portrait on the fundraiser box and discovered he had cancer. He also discovered Walter and Hank's relationship. Walter arrived home to find a shocking scenario. A bunch of reporters put up equipment in his residence to interview Walter and his family. Everyone was dressed formally except Walter. Marie told a newspaper patient about her son's crowdfunding website, prompting to today's interview. Walter knew how the website money came from, thus fewer people should know. He would have to appear on TV if the news spread. This enraged Walter to the brink of bursting. On surgery day, Walter lay in bed while Skylar removed superfluous objects. Walter, under anesthesia, seemed confused and inquired which phone she was talking about when she asked if his phone was still on him. Skylar knows the truth. But now was not the time to settle scores. Walter's surgery and rehab went well. Living longer shouldn't be hard. Later, Walter went to the hospital for a checkup, and Skylar's main concern was when Walter could live alone. The doctor says Walter can do so now. Skylar started packing for a weekend at Marie's with their daughter at home. Walter must leave within two days, she added. Walter was confused and shocked. Skylar faced Walter. She covertly investigated during Walter's rehabilitation and found that Gretchen had never donated. She also called Walter's mother, who said Walter had never visited her and didn't know about his sickness. Every falsehood was revealed, leaving Walter speechless. He begged Skylar's stay to speak the truth. Skylar was helpless after the falsehoods. She departed with their daughter without looking back. Walter's father had been silently grieving since losing Jane. Seeing the jet named Jane distracted him from his air traffic controller work. An instruction problem caused the planes to crash. One piece fell into Walter's pool. A pink to Eddie Bear fell with it. If Walter knew Jane's father caused this accident, how would he feel? Everything began with Jane's death, caused by Walter's inaction. Jesse wondered if he could conquer addiction and start over. Will Walter and Skylar reconcile after this? Would Walter tell all the truth if he could? This is a complete recap of the second season of Breaking Bad. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a like and subscribe to our channel. See you in the next recap.